he thinks he's working uh, in the heart of British politics, in his own way. He thinks he's a pacifist who's been forced to carry a rifle. A, a front runner for, a, for a gay and lesbian civil rights. The activist who will speak on behalf of our community. Tony Blair of Gayville. Uh, I don't really know who he is. I think he thinks he's a gay evangelist. Just a normal gay bloke. He thinks he's right, and he is. He thinks he is a Petula Clark fan. An ambassador for gay rights. He's a highly principled person. And I think he really doesn't give a damn what people think about him. Is he the MP for Brighton? Oh, yeah, but who does he think he is? Yeah, I think that's, that answers the question, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Who, who is he? <coughs> We're extremely lucky today to have Mr. Peter Thatcher with us, who's a very well known and um, highly prolific human rights campaigner and activist. Thank you very much. Well, I've been asked to speak on the theme of taking risks for human rights. And really what I'd like to impress on you is that this isn't something that just someone like me can do. It doesn't take an extraordinary person. It in fact takes an ordinary person who's willing and prepared to do extraordinary things. I put you under arrest on charges of torture under the United Nations Convention Against Torture. Mr. Tatchell was then set upon by the President's security guards for the first, but not the last time. There wasn't much interest or concern about what was happening in Zimbabwe. The human rights abuses were terrible. But they were hardly being reported. And there was no major campaign to try and defend the people who were suffering there. And I felt as a human being that I should do something. So <laughs> I hit on the idea of trying to use international human rights laws to arrest President Mugabe. But three of his government officials wait to attack Mr. Tatchell. One says, we'll find you and we'll kill you. It's, it was Peter at his best, but at his craziest, because those, they could have easily killed him. You know, these people carry arms. They could easily have killed Peter. But, but I think there's something deep, deep down in, in him where he has to psych himself up. He's a deeply private man. He's very fine. Um, but he psychs himself up. I think he hates doing this direct action. I think it, it pays havoc with him. I've seen him shaking before he's, he's done something. Right now I'm assembling affidavits from Zimbabwean tortured victims which implicate President Mugabe in the use of torture as a weapon of political repression. Of the affidavits you got of torture victims, how many were tortured post-July last year, or all since July? Them. All of them. Yeah. And how many? That's all yeah. Yeah. All of them. How many are we talking about? Um, the, the ones I have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, three. 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 Brilliant. Recently, my young brother has been shot on both legs and um, in the arm, and he's now on arrest because of being shot by a uh, ZANU PF uh, sympathizer. So it's like the situation in Zimbabwe is terribly bad and I wish Mugabe should go. My name is Adele. I'm a refugee here. I am a Zimbabwean. I ran away from Mugabe regime after being tortured, um, raped. Can you borrow your Yeah, sure. Um, my plan is in a few weeks' time to bring a case in Bow Street Magistrates Court where I will seek to get an arrest warrant and an extradition order against President Mugabe. The application for an arrest warrant has at least a chance of starting the legal process to prosecute Mugabe. Now, if the arrest warrant is issued, then it's highly unlikely that the courts in Zimbabwe would extradite him to this country for trial. But courts in other countries, like, say, South Africa, might be more willing either to extradite him to this country for trial or even to try them himself. Peter, I want you to shake your hand and say thanks yeah. for arresting Mugabe and when are you Trying to arrest him. Again? Trying to arrest him. <laughs> you do it again? Oh, and, uh, something else is planned soon, so, yeah. For the last couple of years, I've been liaising with a newly emerging clandestine underground resistance inside Zimbabwe organizing under the name of the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement. 
they are proposing to launch a fourth Chimarenga, a war of liberation, to overthrow President Mugabe and to install a democratic government. What the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement wants is a press conference where they can announce their existence to the world and also outline their plan for the overthrow of the Mugabe regime. They've asked me to organise that here in London on their behalf. My advice to them was that simply reading out a statement from their leaders wouldn't be sufficient. So what I've arranged is for them to secretly film inside Zimbabwe uh, statements from the leaders together with military training footage which can then be shown at the press conference when the launch takes place. I made this plaque up as a way of doing a bit of a spoof on Mugabe. Uh, sometimes wit and humour is a better way of debunking tyrants and torturers than being all angry. Um, the reaction I've got so far has been fantastic. I'm feeling pretty exhausted but uplifted by the spirit of this march. I mean, one of the things people don't understand is that because I've become so well known here and all over the world, I'm constantly on call from activists and media people from all different continents. And it's a great honor and a privilege, but it's also incredibly tiring. The government won't negotiate directly with Peter Tatchell, but they will negotiate directly with the likes of gay lobby group Stonewall. So you might end up in a situation where Peter does the work and brings the issue to public attention and embarrasses the government. And then Stonewall is able to do what it does best and lobby and campaign and be the respectable side. Stonewall do an incredibly valuable job, but they go up as lovers. You know, they go in, have lunch at Westminster, meet people. They're the acceptable face of homosexuality. It's accepted as Peter uh, often states that there are many, many ways to skin a cat and there are many, many ways to change the world. And, uh, always are needed. We would like to welcome a man of stage who's done so much over the years. Will you please welcome Peter Tatchell. Yes. Hi, Pride in the Park. Thank you so much for staying here in the rain. I have a little friend to introduce. A little friend we know very well. Roberta Mugabe, the Queen of Tyranny! Well, I interrupt other people's events, so that why shouldn't they interrupt mine? Here at last is the tape from Zimbabwe, from the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement. Hopefully uh, statements from the leaders, uh, together with footage of underground military operations and training. Well, here is the tape, but it's not in the packaging I expected. It's come concealed inside an electric fence voltmeter. Um, there's also a concern because the package has gone astray for six days in transit. My concern is that it's almost certain that this is, as it says, the tapes inside. But what happens if the package has been intercepted and the contents have been replaced with something more sinister? Um, I think I'd like to take it somewhere to get it checked. Uh, I'm Peter Tatchell. Yes. Hi. Um, I've been sent a package in the post that I'm a little bit concerned about. Why, do you work here? No, 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 I don't work here. Right. So, 
Um, I was wondering if you could run it through the scanner to have a look at it. Could I come into the building and you do it for me? Well, no, because you, you're not coming into the building to do anything in the building. Well, I'm, coming, I'm going to come into the building. For what? Just to have a look. No, it is not for that purpose. The okay. building is not open to the public. Okay. I'm not paranoid, although <laughs> probably I've got good reason to be. There's been hundreds of attacks on my home over the last 20 years. I've had uh, plots to kill me by neo-Nazis like Combat 18. He needs protection. He, he, you should borrow some of the royal families. Um, no one's going to bother killing them. They don't need all those um, especially trained police officers. They should hand some over to Peter Tatchell. He lives in this bizarre little place near Luckham Castle. He gets mugged regularly on the way home. On one occasion, I think he was mugged five times in a month. I know that he gets firebombed, excrement put through his doors. What he goes through, I just can't imagine. I feel so lucky not to have had to, have, not to, have had to experience what he's experienced, but he does it because he's absolutely committed to what he believes in. Because of all the attacks I've experienced, I had to convert my flat into a mini Fort Knox with four major sets of locks. Maybe he'd feel safer if you got a big dog that was a, a, a Rottweiler kind of dog. If Peter was a dog, he would be a crossbreed, I'm sorry to say, a cross between a pointer, uh, a kind of gun dog, very focused and sleek and determined. And um, but then there's, there, there would have to be um, something, a bit of a, a crested Chinese, you know those dogs with no fur, just the mottled skin, that would symbolise people's... Um, irritation with him. People get very irritated by him and those dogs, I'm sure, are very irritating. I think, rather unfairly, the biggest, criti or the biggest critics of Peter Tatchell have been the gay community. As an example of, gay man, of a gay man, I think he's quite despicable. I don't like him. You know, he's come out with some, some bollocks about the Gulf War, for example. Yeah, he thinks he's a do-gooder, I think. There are some gay people who are ashamed of him. Like, I, I do find him sort of like a bit in your face, though. I don't think he goes about things the right way, to be quite honest. He's, he's very militant about how he does it, um, and therefore I think he's, in a lot of cases, more likely to alienate the people that he's trying to get to, to change things. Many years ago, I used to find him more inclusive, more involved with, with other groups of LGBT people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And these days, I have found him more isolated in working on his own separate initiative, and I think that's very problematic, because he is sometimes seen to speak for our community, but if he is not actually consulting with the community and reflecting the, the range of views of the community, then I don't think he's entitled to speak to any, for anyone but himself. I don't think any of us who are involved in that kind of work ever pretend that we're doing anything else than um, representing our opinions and representing the opinions of others as best as we can as we see them. But we don't necessarily say we have the whole of the answers. And I certainly don't think that Peter has ever said that he speaks for all gay people on this subject. I think sometimes the media pick on certain people and give them a high profile. So I don't think it's Peter's fault. Peter will take every opportunity he gets to speak out, to appear on television, to appear in a newspaper. That is what he does. We can't criticise him for that. He's an activist. It's 5am and I've just been woken by a rather scary nightmare. Uh, in my dream, I was at a friend's house and I got a phone call uh, informing me that the suspect package that I've been stashing under my kitchen sink really is a bomb and that it's time to go off uh, in an hour. So I set up on my bike, but my legs are just like putty, I just can't cycle. Then I have a puncture, so I abandon the bike, and just as I'm running towards my flat, boom! Well, the problem is I can't take it to the police because their standard procedure is to destroy suspect packages in controlled explosions. And obviously, if it is a video, then that would destroy the video that I need. As well as living in this one-bedroom council flat, it's also my campaign headquarters. And in a one-bedroom council flat, that's quite difficult. As you'll see, there's piles of papers everywhere. Not that I like the clutter, but there's nowhere else to put anything. There's no more room for filing cabinets or anything. I've exhausted the available space, but somehow, in amongst some of the chaos, there is some order and some semblance. There's a sort of a filing system that only I understand and know. 
I never started out to be a human rights campaigner. Um, it happened sort of by accident. Uh, when I was at 16, my first passion was for art and design, and that's what I did. I loved it. I was quite successful. But then, as a gay person and as someone you know, with a concern about all human rights abuses, I began to get involved in campaigns like for Aboriginal land rights in Australia against the war in Vietnam. I intend to carry on as long as my physical and mental health uh, maintains. Um, I can quite envisage myself still battling on at the age of 90 or more. I think I'm quite difficult to live with um, because the pressure of my work is so relentless and constant. Um, I work ridiculous hours. Um, it's not uncommon for me to work a 16-hour, 18-hour day. Um, I hardly have time to eat or sleep. I enjoy relationships, but I also enjoy being single. Um, Having a relationship to me is not an imperative. If I meet the right person, then that would be great. Um, but I haven't in recent years. Um, and I get on with my life with a network of wonderful, supportive friends. I think one of the reasons why Tatchell might not have the close relationship, I mean, is Peter is smart enough to know the only tenable situation is one of equality. And I can see it. I mean, who is Peter's equal? He'd be really hard for another man to take on. I think in many ways, it's sad the way in which the gay scene tends to prioritize sex over friendship. To me, the most important thing is friendship. Um, relationships are great, but they're not the be all and end all. He had a long relationship at 17, I know that, when he was very young. And I think he has those sort of delicious holiday flings, you know, he does that. Um, because he's the sort of youngest, he's much younger than his years, he's kind of got the energy and dining with him. And I think, you know, like a lot of men of his age, he quite likes, you know, young, cute guys. But he doesn't get involved, he doesn't do gay bars, he doesn't do anything gay when he hasn't got the time. I think he has, you know, a few, a few sweet moments on holiday. Sex is great fun, it, it's a huge pleasure. People should have the right to make their own sexual choices. That's what I've been campaigning for all those years. In, in the mid-90s, the, the arrests of gay men were, were so high, particularly on cruising grounds and so on, um, that he decided to sort of disturb the police in their attempts to arrest gay men and this, this sort of muck up their investigations. Now, uh, police tend to turn a blind eye to, um, uh, to gay people having sex in public places, cruising grounds or cottages or whatever, um, and where possible try and deal with that in a more sensitive um, and appropriate manner. One thing I don't agree with, uh, with Peter is, was, uh, is about when he tried to, um, to, to um, make a law uh, about gay people having sex in public places, such as Russell Square at the time. And I was totally outraged and so angry about it, because why should we, gay people, be entitled to have sex in public places? Especially in an area where, I mean, the Russell Square is not that big, and it's in the centre of London, and you have couples with kids or older people who are just uh, living the area, and why should they see uh, gay people or two men having sex. I believe in sexual human rights for everyone, gay and straight. Obviously having sex in broad daylight uh, in an open visible place is wrong because some people will be offended. But in the middle of the night, in a thick wooded area, I can't see the problem.
a lot of people only remember the very big high profile campaigns. They forget all the behind the scenes work that's little known, unpublicized, uh, but which does good work. I'm thinking of the uh, campaigns uh, against the military ban on lesbian and gay people. Gay and bisexual people can serve with distinction in the armed forces. According to some officers who knew Montgomery personally, Montgomery was in fact bisexual. Um, you know, outrage took up that issue before almost anyone else uh, because we believe that military homophobia and discrimination is wrong. Another campaign that got very little publicity but which was very effective was the turn-in at Bow Street Police Station in 1991. There we got a whole lot of gay couples to sign a statement confirming that they'd broken various of Britain's antiquated homophobic sex laws. And that they have, they have had sex younger than the age of consent, you know what I mean. Modeled on the sort of tactics of Martin Luther King, you know, we were committing civil disobedience to shame and embarrass the government and the police. Sex is not the centre of my life. Um, it never has been. I think my love and sex life has gone down in inverse proportion to my notoriety or whatever. Ten years ago, um, Peter was outside uh, school gates I'm handing out leaflets about uh, uh, um, and campaigning and being heckled by parents. We were really fed up with the way in which the lack of sex education for lesbian and gay kids in schools was being ignored. The education department and the government would not take it seriously. They didn't recognise that the homophobia of heterosexual kids had to be challenged in order to make the school classroom a safe place for queer kids. So we handed out leaflets to school kids, informing them about the facts of gay sexuality so they could be more understanding and accepting of their friends who are gay. And now I understand that he's actually going to schools and being invited there to talk to, talk to the children. Way back, way, way back in the early 90s, the Church of England was adopting a very hardline position. It said that homosexual acts were wrong, that homosexuals must repent. Most of its leaders were getting up in public and saying that lesbian and gay people were not entitled to human rights. What really angered me was the fact that some of the bishops who were making these anti-gay pronouncements were themselves secretly gay. With my outrage colleagues, we decided to name those bishops. What I object to is a matter of principle. I think that as lesbians, gay men, bisexual and transgender people, we have fought and we fight for our own right to determine when and where and the manner in which we come out. And when we come out, we often negotiate to whom we come out. So we might be out to our families and not to our workmates. We might be out to our workmates and not to our families. There are a whole host of people. People who are you know, religious might not be out in their, in their, in their place of worship, but they're out in other places. Neither myself nor outrage have ever outed anyone because they're gay and in the closet. Uh, our outing has been ethically motivated. What we're attacking is not just their homophobia, but their hypocrisy. The way in which they publicly condemn homosexuality and vote for discriminatory anti-gay laws while privately having secret illicit gay affairs. <laughs> Whenever I think of Peter, I think of him storming the pulpit of Canterbury Cathedral on the Easter Sunday. And then Luke tells us they remember... Dr. Carey supports discrimination against lesbian and gay people. He opposes lesbian and gay human rights. This is not a Christian teaching. You know, Peter has been trying for some eight years or so to try to get, you know, a message of uh, inclus including uh, gay and lesbian equality in the church. And to Dr. Carey, but it, it hasn't happened, so he took that action. There is nothing in Christ's teaching which justifies Dr. Carey's opposition. And for me, it was quite a positive action. It was non-violent, um, but it was blown out of proportion. And that evening, I phoned him. And you know what? He was so kind of sweet and grateful for the phone call. It's as though nobody else... Had 
said anything and he'd just gone home to sort of hide under the bed feeling terrible. And he said, I was, I was terrified. He said, I just was so scared. I sat in the back of the back cathedral and thought, I've got to do it, I've got to do it, I've got to do it. I had to really psych myself up and he said, I knew I had to do it. I was found guilty of indecent behaviour in a church under the 1860 Ecclesiastical Courts Jurisdiction Act. Under that legislation, uh, any protest in a church, no matter how brief and peaceful, is deemed to be indecent. Um, the magistrate uh, took the view that although technically I had broken this draconian law, he didn't regard it as a major offence and sort of hinted that he thought it was rather a waste of police and public money. So he could have fined me, I think, something like £5,000 uh, and given me up the jail sentence of, of three or six months. But instead, um, I was fined the princely sum of £18.60, uh, a reference to the 1860 Act under which I was convicted. Peter is part of a political uh, theatre. He puts on a show. He makes a statement uh, through a piece of drama. It's like a sketch. It's like a cartoon in a newspaper. It, it's, it's something. Makes you think. Makes you listen. Well, if you don't like that sort of thing, you're going to accuse the person who does it of, of doing it for egotistical reasons. Does Peter have an ego? Yes. You need an ego to perform. Well, I, I would know, wouldn't I? The positive outcome of that protest in Canterbury Cathedral was that shortly afterwards, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr George Carey, met with the lesbian and gay Christian movement for the first time. So I feel that we were vindicated. That protest did get positive results. That was very, very important to me because the purpose of doing a direct action is to get media coverage in order to profile an issue, to create public awareness, and to put pressure on the authorities to act. Many of the values that seem to underpin mainstream gay culture, particularly on the gay scene, don't really interest me. Um, you know, I, I don't believe in materialism or consumerism. I don't think having the latest clothes or hairstyle or um, going to the latest club is the be all and end all. I think it's rather sad that the commercial gay scene pushes us in that kind of direction, that we value each other not by our own intrinsic humanity, but by the material possessions and, and lifestyle we adopt. I finally got the box, and it's been a huge, huge effort to get it checked out to make sure it isn't a bomb. In the end, I had to go to a friend who works in a nightclub as a bouncer. He got it put through an x-ray scanner and a um, explosive test, and it's come out okay. TV needs something to show, and I think it's far better that leaders of the ZFM uh, are shown speaking in their own words rather than just me prattling on. So hopefully um, hearing them speak in their own words about their agenda will uh, give us the positive effect of some good coverage. And here we have the tape. Uh, now I've got the tape. It's only just the beginning. There's a huge number of things I've got to do. And I've only got a few days to do everything in time for the news conference. I've got a small Hi8 video which I need transferred to uh, either Beta SP or maybe Mini DV. What is really piling on the pressure is the fact that as well as organising the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement launch, I also have to deal with the daily deluge of hundreds of emails, phone calls and faxes. Uh, they come from all over the world including journalists requesting interviews and quotes, universities and other organisations inviting me to lecture human rights organisations and community and pressure groups. As a matter of civility and courtesy, I feel obliged to respond to them. But the process of responding is killing me. He works tirelessly all the time and he takes nothing for it. 
I can't actually disclose because I'm sure you told me privately how much he earns, but it's a pittance. Um, the other thing I want to ask is, do you have access to an edit suite? Because this you know, video needs a bit of editing. I don't do things for the sake of political expediency or because I want praise or favour. I do them because I believe they are right. And I will stand by those ideas and values even if other people denounce and condemn me. I don't know if you'd be able to help me. Um, I urgently need some help with transcribing um, a video. At heart, I'm not an extrovert. Physically, I'm not the most robust of people. And I'm plagued by constant self-doubt. I don't think there's any campaign I've ever done which I felt totally happy about. You know, I'm always critical, always thinking to myself, I could have done that better. It's just gone two o'clock in the morning and I'm still up and working. In fact, I only finished my evening meal from last night, about an hour or so ago. Um, the whole day, right from the very earliest hours, has been a series of non-stop deadlines, emergencies and crises. People phoning up, emailing, wanting things, which is all, of course, great. You know, it helps my human rights campaign. But, you know, it has been a remorseless, constant pressure, and I'm feeling very, very tired. So tired, in fact, that when I was preparing my evening meal, I really badly cut my finger, uh, and it was bleeding for about nearly an hour, which is a sure sign that my body's healing capacity is not up to par. I'm obviously very, very run down. Good morning, it's Peter Tatchell. Um, I just wanted to speak to you about the possibility of hiring a room. And I need a venue probably to accommodate about 20 journalists. You're, uh, so you're, you're fully booked. No, no, no other rooms available at all. That one's not available. That one's not available. That one's not available. That one's not available. Now try the ICA. Agreeing to help the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement has forced me to resolve a very difficult, awkward moral dilemma. All of my political activism for human rights has been based on the principle of non-violence. In a society where there is at least a degree of democracy and where the opportunity for peaceful change exists, I don't think it can ever be justified to resort to political violence. Uh, in Zimbabwe, the people don't have that option. Anybody who wants to cover this story has to be at the ICA at 10.30 tomorrow morning. I, I don't, I, I'm just a lone individual. I don't have an organisation behind me. I haven't got any staff, I haven't got thousands of pounds, I've got no money at all. So I can't bite things to you. The word impossible does not exist. There are just degrees of difficulty. We're offering the full 18 minute um, videotape of the leaders of the underground resistance inside Zimbabwe. I don't know what Channel 4 ITN are offering you. In the battle for human liberation, different people work in different ways. I suppose I'd see my contribution, if it has any value, is in asking awkward, difficult questions and raising issues that many people would prefer to ignore. I suppose in that sense I'm a bit of a nuisance and a troublemaker, but uh, sometimes that's what it takes to change the world. In the run-up to today's launch of the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement has been really, really hectic and incredibly exhausting. Uh, it's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster. On the one hand, I felt very excited and uplifted and inspired that I'm part of this launch. But on the other hand, you know, the pressures have been absolutely phenomenal. I'm just feeling really, really tired. Um, it's really difficult for me to be coherent and think straight. And I've got a press conference to do in two or three hours' time. If you haven't got huge resources, um, then you've got to do your best with what you've got. I just hope that at the end of the day that uh, I manage to pull off something that is professional 
and effective. I don't know how the media are going to treat this launch. Will they give a big coverage? Well, I'm not too sure. I doubt it will be headlines, but so long as there's some good, solid coverage. Good morning. I'd like to thank you all for coming to this launch of the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement. Uh, the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement is a new underground clandestine resistance movement that's been established inside Zimbabwe with the aim of forcing President Mugabe to step down or failing that to remove him by force. The Zimbabwe Freedom Movement have said that they are prepared to use, quote, judicious use of appropriate force. Once all of the above has been achieved, it is our hope that the democratically elected new president and government of Zimbabwe put in place the mechanisms for Robert Gabriel Mugabe and his ilk to be put on trial. The ZFM expects that... An if you're campaigning for human rights, then publicizing the cause is part of the process. But speaking personally, I find being filmed, interviewed, and photographed utterly loathsome. You know, it, it's intrusive, it's nerve-wracking. Um, I hate it. This video was smuggled out of Zimbabwe to me via a very circuitous, unusual route. Um, to protect their identities, their voices have been distorted, and their words are spoken by actors. I've just turned three diplomats who are CIO from the Zimbabwe High Commission away at the door and sent them on their way. Could you just repeat that, sir? Well, about three quarters of the way through the press conference that was closed to, and only for the press, um, three gentlemen from the Zimbabwe High Commission made their presence known and asked if they could come into the room. I denied their request, um, knowing that if they were from the High Commission, that they'd either heard of what was going on through the news today or people had been calling them if they knew anything about it. And I chose to not let them in to disrupt what was being given to the press and um, asked them to please leave. Thank you for coming. Who's that? Can I ask you? They're CIO. Who are they? They Central Intelligence. I know all of them. You know, those people who work in at the embassy, they are evil people. They are almost the same as Mugabe. They operate under the orders of their um, president Mugabe. He's not my president, the evil president. I mean, that's why I want to keep them away. Well, pe pe it's Peter's security. Are they trying to disrupt me? Mm -hmm. I think it went quite well. Um, there weren't as many press and media there as I expected, but lots of them got copies in advance and the videotape has been sent out on wires uh, to all TV companies. So I'm pretty confident that the message will get out. If I was President Mugabe and wanted to discredit this, I would say it was launched by one man, a white man, someone who's been outside Zimbabwe for a very long time. I would also name President Mugabe say that he was gay and use that as an insult. So I think 
however well-intentioned Mr. Thatcher is, for the fact for him to front it probably gives ammunition to the government. I was invited by them. I didn't invite myself. In fact, when they asked me to facilitate their message to the outside world, I said that I thought this campaign would be better done by a black Zimbabwean. Uh, they agreed, but they said they couldn't spare any of their key people to come to London to do it. So who knows whether this um, campaign can actually work and can actually bring about change in Zimbabwe, but it's probably the biggest news in that country for a long time that there's now actually organised resistance. And it's going to be interesting, I think, to see what the force is exactly that's going to be used, because Peter Thatcher was keen to stress uh, defensive violence, which possibly seems a slightly paradoxical that you could have defensive violence. So we'll be interested to see whether they can maintain that discipline or whether you know, the ZFM movement becomes perhaps dispirited and, and uses other means, perhaps more uh, akin to terrorism. You know, we have to wait and see. His own fight for the liberation of Zimbabwe. But now the one time freedom fight it's really quite interesting that um, Channel 4 have taken up this item and hopefully it will lead to a bit more uh, coverage of what's really a difficult situation to understand. And I guess people will look for a high profile figure who has the integrity that Peter Tatchell has, has built up over the years. He's got this almost religious seal which is really interesting. Um, if he were a fundamentalist, Christian or Muslim or anything else, um, people would be slightly dismayed because he would have a vested interest. But I think his wide-ranging approach to um, civil and human rights makes him much, much more than a single-dimension character. You'd find it very, very hard now to attack him because he's taken a self-interested approach. It isn't. Clearly, he's not going to benefit in any way from supporting Zimbabwe. He's not just interested in being um, a gay rights campaigner, and he's certainly not interested in what goes with power and prestige and the risk he puts himself at. I mean, that's something that, um, that I think is probably unique in his build-up and his character. Where it comes from, I don't know. I really don't know. Here's a photograph of me when I was seven months old. I was born in Melbourne, Australia in 1952 uh, in a very rough, tough inner-city working-class district. Uh, my father worked as a lathe operator in an engineering factory. My mother was a housewife. Neither of them had any real aspirations or ambitions. Uh, the expectation was that I'd end up in a factory as well. Uh, I don't know how I've ended up the way I am because I'm completely different from everybody else in my family. I grew up at a time when there was no National Health Service in Australia. My mother was a chronic asthmatic. She suffered from very severe, even life-threatening asthma attacks. As a result, we were very, very poor, even by working class standards. I can remember often coming home from school and being hungry and going to the cupboards and there being nothing there. You know, he had a, he had a difficult upbringing in Australia. Um, he brought up his siblings. So I think he's always had a, a fight. He's always had that caring thing. He's always wanted things to be better for other people. Um, I don't think his family life was all that easy. So he was, in a way, the carer. Because my mother spent quite a lot of time bedridden and in hospital, uh, from about the age of eight onwards, it fell to me to um, bring up my younger brother and two sisters. At the time, I sort of found it to be, you know, a bit of a chore, but I also felt quite proud of taking on this responsibility. Um, it actually has, has been a great boon for the rest of my life because it made me independent and resourceful. And he was an activist very young. I think he was fighting for rights in, uh, you know, at 16. Right from year one, I got very involved in initiating all kinds of new activities in school. So here's a picture of me with the school magazine committee. Uh, which I helped set up. A bit later, I learned that lots of Aboriginal children were not completing their education because economic pressures forced them to go out to work. So together with other students, I had the idea of doing uh, a sponsored long walk along the beaches of Melbourne uh, to raise money to give these kids scholarships so they could stay on at school. Just as everything was going very well for me at school, suddenly I had to leave. Uh, my parents needed me to go out to work to help supplement the family income. So I knew from personal experience exactly how those Aboriginal kids felt. 
in the mid-afternoon, about three or four hours after the press conference concluded. I was starting to feel a bit down. I think it was probably a combination of extreme tiredness. After all, I only had about three hours sleep last night. Um, I also hadn't eaten. I hadn't even had time to have a shower this morning. I've just been so frantic. So it sort of caught up to me about mid-afternoon. And I was also feeling a, a, a bit sort of depressed about the way I'd handled some of the interviews. Um, I guess they were okay, but I just felt that they could have been sharper and crisper and better. Even now, I can't relax. There are things that have to be done. Um, I'm now being flooded with emails and phone calls from all over the world, from journalists, Zimbabweans, uh, and human rights activists. They want to know about the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement. So, of course, I'm the guy with the information. I've got to tell them. I've got to respond. Well, I was quite good at long distance running. <laughs> you need that in your profession. <laughs> in handy, Run yeah. from Mugabe's hitmen, that's the best way of escape. Yeah. Since all the news coverage about the ZFM, I've been receiving a steady trickle of very bizarre requests from people with all kinds of weird plans for the liberation of Zimbabwe. Um, they seem to think I'm some kind of military quartermaster because I've had requests for 10 surface to air missiles and a light plane with pilot. So it's been a few days since uh, the launch of the ZFM at the press conference and uh, some interesting articles have come out of the press. This one um, you know, is headlined, Freedom Fighters may be Mugabe Trap. So, of course, th this article um, points out rather clearly that the new resistance movement may be a setup by the Mugabe regime as an excuse for further repression, using um, this organization launched in Britain by Peter Tatchell, who's a bait noir of Mugabe's, um, out of a white um, British colonial environment, using that as an excuse to crack down. Now I've been called by various people in Zimbabwe who know that I work closely with Peter. The issues that they brought up were Peter's so naive and he's been set up and does he realise what he's done? The allegation that the ZFM is a set up or a front created by Mugabe's secret police is pure speculation. It's appeared in one newspaper without a shred of evidence to back it up. If Mugabe's government had created the ZFM in order to justify a crackdown on the opposition, surely they would have boasted, we know all about the ZFM and we're going to crush them. Um, to see him being, uh, I suppose, a feature of international news, uh, for him must be uh, quite an event, because uh, as I recall, going back a good 20 years, he was the subject of a great deal of column inches in, in the tabloid press, uh, particularly newspapers like The Sun. Um, and uh, there, was a, there was a strange attitude towards him then. It was, it was pretty vile, but nevertheless, Peter was a selected candidate for the Labour Party in Bermondsey in 81. We remember what became known as the Battle of Bermondsey. Peter was the Labour Party candidate in the by-election there. It was a pretty nasty by-election. It was during the early 80s. And uh, Peter's sexuality uh, became known. It was known to the leadership. Um, and what was appalling was that his sexuality, uh, the fact that he was gay, uh, was used by Labour activists against him. Uh, it was also used by his political opponents and, quite frankly, Peter was shat on by the Labour Party. Um, and I think it deeply uh, affected Peter. I don't think he trusts politicians anymore. During that period, the run-up to the by-election, he was absolutely slaughtered by the, the tabloid press. So at that stage, they just piled on all the nastiness you could pile on somebody just by identifying them as gay then. Um, it was around the time when HIV first appeared, so talking about the gay plague, um, just detaching any sort of filth or nastiness they could. Although interestingly enough, 
when I went on a demo with Peter and saw him sort of, we were waiting to demonstrate and all the press would be hanging out with us, the first thing I noticed was there was this rapport between Peter and the press, even, you know, reports from the Express or Mail, quite right-wing papers, and be like, all right, Peter, how are you? What, do you? what have you got in store for us this time? So, you know, there'd be sort of that dichotomy between their quite sort of personal relationship with him. They probably knew him from lots of demos, but then the sort of nasty things they'd write about him afterwards. Anyway, that changes over the whole Robert Mugabe thing. This was something that the mainstream, the straight press, if you like, could identify with. You know, for this they could hail him, for this they could praise him, because it wasn't associated with the whole gay rights agenda. Right now I'm feeling a mixture of very different conflicting emotions. Part of me is totally ground down and worn out. Another part of me is absolutely overjoyed and enthused by the success of the campaign. Um, I set out to get the Zimbabwe Freedom Movement's message to the wider world. I've achieved that. I've achieved it at a price. I really push myself to the limits to make sure that that press conference worked. I'm coming down with a very bad cold. I'm aching all over. Right now I've got to do something urgent to earn some money. All the work I've done for the ZFM has been unpaid. But obviously I've got to buy food, pay rent, you know, do my bills like gas and electricity. I'm just going to have to knuckle down and force myself to uh, write some articles to get some cash. I've received a number of messages from people inside Zimbabwe warning me that I should take extra care about my personal security. They fear that because of my association with the ZFM, I may become a target for Mugabe's secret police. I have been told that I'm on a hit list from Mugabe's secret police, the CIO, that I have actually been targeted for assassination. I know the ZANU PF government is trying, is using each and every instrument to uh, instill fear in all the people, even here in the UK. We've met some of our black Zimbabweans who have been inter interrogated here in the UK by the people from uh, the Mugabe regime. These men are ruthless. Um, I'm just hoping that they've got enough on their hands inside Zimbabwe without bothering with someone like me. I, I feel Peter Tasho is in danger because of what he started. I'm really, really run down. I can barely cope. I feel on the verge of collapse. But one thing I'm certain of, despite all those negative feelings, I'm not going to give up and walk away. I'm going to do whatever it takes to ensure that I maximise the success of this campaign. I just hope that in the process I don't kill myself. When Peter dies and goes to heaven, I believe that he will have a place, you know, in the right hand of God, because um, his campaign is a campaign of love. And I know about, I know about Peter Tatchell because I play him in, in the X-Men films. I play Magneto. I play the man who is proud to be a mutant, uh, will not uh, apologize for being different, uh, and will on occasion uh, put himself in danger uh, and, and in ways of violence uh, to defend uh, his rights to be the person he is. Peter has got no, seems to have no trace of who he is. I just don't think he thinks who he is. He just gets up every day and thinks, I've got to fight this battle. Peter has no sensation of being Peter Tatchell. I went to a gay pride um, day once with him, just for a fun day, and I watched people, uh, waves that have parted and people want to touch him and say hello. He's got no idea. He's like a beautiful girl who doesn't know she's beautiful. Peter just knows what he does. He doesn't know who he is. Who do I think I am? I'm just one human rights activist among millions. And like those other millions, I refuse to accept society as it is. I want something better. As I said at the beginning, if you find you can do it, you can do it. We've all got the capacity to make a difference. And if you want to know a little bit more about my campaign, my website is www.pedertatchell.net. Thank you.
Thank you.